Uh, greetings to everyone and welcome to our Congressional Neuroscience Caucus. Uh, today uh, we're going to celebrate the brain research through advancing innovative technologies, that is the brain initiative. Uh, the researchers discovering key secrets to this most complex organ and the profound meanings for healthcare and society. So I'm Matt Rizzo. I'm the board chair of the American Brain Coalition uh, and Reynolds professor and chair in the Department of Neurological Sciences at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We're a proud member of the ABC. The ABC, the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, the Dana Foundation, uh, the International Neuro Neuroethics Society, the Simons Foundation are all proud to join the Congressional Neuroscience Caucus today to hold this briefing. The eighth annual Brain Initiative meeting was held just this week, a couple of days ago, and there were many exciting uh, presentations and opportunities for engagement. Um, we, we see that there's unprecedented discovery of mind and brain mechanisms that are providing critical targets and opportunities for treating and curing psychiatric and neurological disorders. Even more, neuroscience extends beyond the laboratory and the clinic. It gets into classrooms, courtrooms, offices, homes around the world and travel in between. And we're seeing unprecedented tools for understanding ourselves as social, moral, and spiritual beings. So today we're gonna to explore responsible uh, uh, use of advances in brain science with outreach for strong civic engagement, with opportunities to address unmet healthcare needs of our rural and urban underserved. In that regard, uh, the Congressional Neuroscience Caucus, co-chaired by Earl Blumenauer and Congressman Kathy McMorris Rogers, was established over a decade ago in 2010 the purpose has been to build awareness of the key role that brain research plays in understanding ourselves and society, to communicate research progress and benefits, and to advance federal policies to support neuroscience research. And we are really glad that Congressman Blumenauer is here with us today. Uh, he serves the third congressional district in Oregon. He's a lifetime uh, resident of Portland he was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1996. Importantly, on the Ways and Means Committees promoted health care access and environmental reform. reform. <clears throat> He's been a really strong champion for patients with neurological and psychiatric disorders and for our researchers who are developing treatments and cures to combat these disorders. So again, we're really honored to have Representative Blumenauer with us today. And Congressman, please take it away. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you for your service as chair of our uh, ABC. Uh, appreciate your leadership uh, and uh, moderating today's conversation. Um, as you referenced, uh, we've been doing this for about a decade now. Uh, it was launched to um, focus on the brain initiative that was, seeks to revolutionize and deepen our understanding of the human brain, the most important three pounds uh, in the human body. Um, the initiative continues to break down barriers with your research. And along with my co-chair, Representative McMorris Rogers, who's been fantastic in this role. She's been a great partner. Uh, we've worked to ensure that Congress provides necessary funding and policy framework for this important project. This April, uh, we led our annual bipartisan letter to the Appropriations Committee to advocate for continued robust funding for this program. And I look forward to continuing this support throughout the appropriations process. You know, we've seen amazing advances in uh, healthcare. Uh, we've had breakthroughs with uh, uh, cardiovascular health, uh, with cancer. And while there have been some advances, to be sure, in neuroscience, we haven't yet got the, the breakthrough. Uh, that would be uh, have the same sort of game-changing effort. Uh, 
Uh, we want to make sure that we continue uh, with the BRAIN initiative with appropriate funding uh, that will get that uh, foundation for research and development that will lead to that breakthrough. Uh, neuroscience uh, disorders touch virtually every single family in America. It has tremendous consequences in terms of quality of life, in terms of healthcare and cost, social disorder. I continue to advocate for this uh, research and we're going to continue working uh, to promote medical breakthroughs and strengthen biomedical research. Today, the panelists will discuss the importance of neuroethics, studying the ethical, legal, and social societal implications of neuroscience. I mean, these are some of the most challenging areas of human inquiry and research. The impact of brain diseases and disorders, as we all know, can be devastating for individuals, for families, and for society. It's why the research is so critical. But as we champion this work, we need to make sure that the ethical challenges that come with such a complex undertaking are dealt with. Expanding our body of research is critical, but so is making sure that the research participants have informed consent and are taken care of even after the trial ends. The nature of this work is necessarily complex and sensitive, but I am confident that we can navigate these breakthroughs in an ethical manner. I'm pleased that the Brain Initiative has already done work on this by establishing a neuroscience, a neuroethics working group and funding neuroethics research projects with federal funding to support them. I'm certain they'll continue to hold the neuroscience research to the highest ethical standards of clinical care and research. It's clear that we're on the cusp of some amazing discoveries. And I'm proud to support the Brain Initiative, work with the Neuroscience Caucus to promote more understanding here on Capitol Hill. The participants in these briefings are the certified smart young people who really run the place. And there is amazing uh, turnout to be able to deal with your program. I appreciate the work of our panelists and want to thank all for joining us and look forward to a productive conversation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And, and thank you very much, Representative Blumenauer. There are maybe 100 million people with uh, mind and brain disorders across the U.S. They need a lot of help and we and they are really grateful for your support. Uh, I want to mention next that uh, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers has also been a champion for us. She represents the fifth district of the state of Washington. Uh, she's the ranking member on the powerful House Energy and Commerce Committee, and that oversees important health related programs and initiatives. Um, she's the first woman to hold the uh, top role for her party on that committee. Uh, she's not able to be with us today, but she's graciously prepared a video message for us and we will share that with you now. Hi everyone, it's Kathy McMorris Rogers from Eastern Washington. I'd like to start off by thanking everyone at the American Brain Coalition and all of today's briefing partners for organizing this informative event. I'm honored to continue leading as the co-chair of the Neuroscience Caucus again this Congress. As you know, the goal of our caucus is simple, to promote a better understanding of how the brain develops, functions, and ages. Our mission has not wavered from raising awareness about the millions of Americans battling neurological disorders or mental illnesses. I was proud to help lead the Brain Initiative again this year, which is aimed at revolutionizing our understanding of the human brain. This is such an important step for being able to address the many devastating brain diseases and conditions impacting millions of Americans each day. I'm pleased you're all coming together today for a discussion on neuroethics. There's no doubt this will become an increasingly important part of the conversation as scientists consider the ethical, legal, 
and societal implications of their groundbreaking research so they can continue to advance our understanding of the body's most complex organ. And this is just the start. I'm confident that with the continued federal investment in biomedical research, we can and we will develop new cures that will save lives and spare millions of people from diseases. Thank you to all of you for the incredible work you do each and every day to advance brain research. Hi, well, uh, thanks again uh, so much to our Congressional Neuroscience Caucus co-chairs, Blumenauer and Rogers. They are true champions for brain and neuroscience research. So now for a little bit of fun, uh, I wanna say that in March, uh, the Brain Initiative launched essay and video contests for high school students. They called it the Brain Initiative Challenge, Ethical Considerations of Brain Technologies. Uh, so students were challenged to discuss ethical implications of emerging brain technologies for understanding the brain and treating brain disorders. Uh, and this week's winners and honorable mentions were just showcased in this week's Brain Initiative meeting. Uh, the first place essay went to Ashley of Greenwich High School in Connecticut for her thoughtful essay uh, called Equity in the Coming World of Neuroenhancements. And I encourage you to view that. Um, take a look at the slide. You'll see there's a link along with other winning essays and videos uh, for you to check out. I'm also excited to uh, present the first place video contest winner for you now. And that's Jake from University Liggett School in Michigan. So let's roll that. Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Jake. When I was younger, I was a pretty ordinary kid. I loved to run around flying kites, ride my bike, do gymnastics, and even flip into the pool. And then that all changed when I was diagnosed with a degenerative neuromuscular disease called Friedrich's ataxia. Not only did I start going to scientific conferences with super smart scientists, but I've now lost the ability to walk or even stand without support. So, as you might imagine, I'm very passionate about advancing research with our brains. I'd encourage scientists to pursue any avenue and open any box that might lead to a breakthrough for me and for others like me. But I do have the basic framework to the brain information that I contribute to research. My participation is voluntary and it should always stay that way. What's mine is mine until I decide to share it. And when I decide to share my biological information with scientists, it's very important that it's de-identified. I'm happy to contribute my individual information to be a part of a greater whole, but that contribution should never be able to be reworked and traced back to me as technologies advance. Most importantly, we shouldn't hesitate to continue to push our understanding of the human brain if we move forward with the focus on curing diseases. As someone who has so much to contribute and whose brain has so much more capacity than my cerebellum will allow my body to utilize, what does the future look like? Thank you for watching. Well, uh, thanks to Jake. That was a brave, insightful, a poignant, a thought provoking and inspirational video. And it, it helps us to understand why we need to keep supporting the research from the Brain Initiative. So next we'll hear from our neuroethics experts. Um, please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A box at any time, you can enter your questions into the screen. And we've made time to answer your questions. 
after the speeches. Let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Joseph Fins. We're so glad to have a person of his distinction. He's the president of the International Neuroethics Society. Uh, he's the E. William Davis, Jr., MD, Professor of Medical Ethics and Chair of the Division of Medical Ethics at Weill Cornell Medical College. Um, he's Professor of Everything. He's a tenured Professor of Medicine, of Medicine and Psychiatry, of Medical Ethics and Neurology, of Medical Ethics and Rehabilitation, and of Healthcare Policy and Research. So thank you, Dr. Fenz. You're on. Thank you so much, Matt. It's really uh, an honor to be here and to follow Jake uh, with his moving uh, conversation with us and, and it reminds us what this brain initiative is really all about. Uh, I'm going to share my slides and hopefully this will work and, and tell you about some, some work that we've been doing uh, through the brain initiative. And I'm here, as, as Matt said, in my capacity as uh, president of the INS, and I'm very grateful to the American Brain Coalition and to our congressional leaders for, for this opportunity. I'm going to talk about a project uh, that, that um, related to uh, disability rights and neuroethics uh, and cognitive restoration. Uh, it's, a, it's a study that was part of a, a, a grant, uh, independent R01, that related to a study of, of patients who had severe brain injury. And I presented some of this work uh, at the Brain Initiative meeting uh, on the 21st. So we're a, uh, my study is related to this parent study, which was uh, central thalamic stimulation for traumatic brain injury. And um, this is where we uh, put electrodes into the thalamus, which is a, uh, a central uh, organ inside the brain. Um, the thalamus is to the brain what Hartsfield Airport is uh, to the Delta airline system. It's the hub. You can't get there from here without going through Atlanta. And you can't get to many parts of the brain without going through the thalamus, and it and it 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 can modulate uh, in our case consciousness. And so what we did was we uh, inserted these electrodes in six patients with moderate to severe brain injury. They have a Glasgow outcome study uh, extended scale of five to seven, which means that that uh, they're able to give consent, they're able to to live in the world, but they have significant impairments. Our uh, age range was 22 to 40, and we had four males and two females. And they were three to 18 years after traumatic brain injury. But the WHO is really representative of people in the country who have severe brain injury. And TBI has been described as a silent epidemic. Uh, these are people walking around. You wouldn't know it until you maybe spoke to them or their family members would know about it uh, because they're not quite the same. They're described as the walking wounded. And, and TBI is really a, a threat to the public health. About a million and a half to two million people a year with varying degrees of impairment, reaching up to six and a half million people. There are wounded warriors who came back from the wars in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And as uh, Congressman Bill Pascrell has described it, uh, TBI is a signature injury of that war, those wars. And a lot of these people get custodial care um, and those with severe brain injury end up in nursing homes and they don't get active treatment. So what we, what we did uh, is we uh, are trying to develop uh, and activate uh, a circuit in the brain called the meso circuit. And the meso circuit is a, uh, a, a set of, of relationships, uh, uh, circuit relationships between the central thalamus and various parts of the brain. And, and the idea here is to improve uh, thalamic output uh, to the cortex uh, that helps to create an integrative set of functions which uh, uh, supports cognition and consciousness. And there are lots of different ways of doing it. And, and we are using deep brain stimulation to drive uh, this circuit. And, and I want to just um, give you a little context. Uh, the work that we, that we presented uh, over at the uh, Brain Initiative uh, meetings uh, earlier this week has a long trajectory. Uh, and this started with a, a planning grant that my colleague, Dr. Nicholas Schiff at Cornell got, uh, and I was part of back in uh, 2001. So this is a 20 plus year arc of work. So I think when we think about funding for these initiatives, we have to appreciate that, you know, you don't discover something in three years or five years. It's often decades of, of concentrated work. And so we got a planning grant for the modest amount of $450,000 in 2001. 
And with that a planning grant, uh, we published in Nature in 2007, uh, a study showing the first use of deep brain stimulation in the minimally conscious state. These are patients who are unable um, to follow commands. Uh, this person could uh, was basically unresponsive, except intermittently could move uh, their eyes. Um, and with deep brain stimulation, and you could see the, the image here, these are, this is an artifact uh, from the electrical filament of the, the metal filament in a CAT scan. These, these are microfilaments, but they look large, a lot larger here. Got bilateral thalamic stimulation as a person who could not talk before stimulation. And with the stimulator was able to say six or seven word sentences, tell his mother he loved her, say the first 16 words of the Pledge of Allegiance and go shopping at Old Navy and express a preference about the kind of clothing he would want. Getting back to the point, this is about people. This is not about a science experiment. This is about helping individuals. He had improved limb control and, and for the first time in six years was able to eat uh, and maintain secretions and chew uh, uh, food and not be dependent on a, on a peg. This is the first time that um, deep brain stimulation was correlated with improvement from very severe brain injury. And we published this in Nature in 2007. The, 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 the daughter of that study was the study that we presented earlier this week, uh, where we did central thalamic stimulation, people who had moderate to severe brain injury. These were people who were able to give consent. These were people who were at a higher level of functioning because we had done the earlier study. We demonstrated a proof of principle effect we demonstrated it was safe. And this study was then to do it in patients who had more to gain, but potentially more to lose. Um, but we had a very robust, uh, as the Congressman mentioned, uh, informed consent process. These people were independently assessed for the decision-making capacity. And five people uh, completed the study, um, all and one was explanted for a min minor skin infection. All, all of the people who completed the study had a greater than 10% improvement in the trail making test part B, which is a measure of processing speed and improved executive function. And two of the five subjects had a one point increase in the Glasgow scale with just three months of stimulation, which is a remarkable thing. Uh, my scientific colleagues would, would, uh, wouldn't want me to say this, but I'll say it. This is a historic inflection point. This is a therapy for a problem uh, that we didn't have a response for. And this is a, uh, I think an important uh, point going forward. My study was um, to hear from the participants um, in, in, this, in this trial. And so um, with an R01 from the Brain Initiative, and I'm immensely grateful uh, to, the, to the, the program officers and the leadership there to fund this kind of research in neuroethics, to, to talk to, to subjects and their families. And we did uh, semi-structured interviews with them preoperatively and postoperatively. All these folks were de determined to have decision-making capacity. And we had a massive amount of data. Uh, preoperatively, you know, nearly 70,000 words of interview uh, text uh, with, with folks uh, beforehand and, and afterwards. And then we coded and, and coded the uh, transcripts deductively, inductively, and had uh, conceptual uh, codes. Uh, a forthcoming article, which is itself is a is an eighteen thousand word manuscript, just captures the preoperative interviews will be published in the Cambridge Quarterly of Healthcare Ethics, Clinical Neuroethics, in, in October. And I'm working on part two right now, which is the postoperative. But let me share some stuff with you. First, um, uh, you know that the notion. Is, you know, I was thinking about it with listening to Jake. Patients who participate in these subjects are pioneers. They're on the threshold of, of important work. And, and you see here on the left screen, uh, a, a family member saying, like I told you, initially I was totally against it. I tried to talk him out of it. As I discussed, it made me understand why he wants to do it because he's so unhappy. So because of that, I want that for him too. I'm going with his gut on this. I pushed very hard, honestly, for him not to do this because I'm concerned and yet it's his life. It's hard to give up control when somebody has been this so grievously injured and you nurse them back to health. But one subject said, if, what about if your parents objected? This isn't a person of adult age who had decision-making capacity. And the respondent said, I'd still do it. You'd still do it? You think it's your decision? It's my decision, yeah. And if they didn't want me to do it, too bad because it's my life. Why is it your decision? Because it's my body and I'm an adult and I have legal consent over myself. 
one thing that's really important is a lot of neuroethicists worry about neuroprosthetics, you know, distorting personal identity, turning us into cyborgs. Well, it's just the opposite. It turns out the brain injury and psychiatric and neuropsychiatric illness can distort personal identity. Um, and, and these interventions can be restorative. So one subject, you know, uh, was described by a family member is totally different person. The essence of my daughter had changed forever, knowing she could never be who she was before. I had to raise her all over again. A subject in this study said, I would say I'm similar, but I'm not sure I would say I'm the same. Parent says the subject is immature version of his former self. You have to separate getting the old him back from getting him to a place where he's suffering less. This captures the burden of the condition and the fact that these people are the same, but they're different. Now, the same mother of that child who felt she lost her daughter, and this is, I think, the historic inflection point, talks about the restoration of the self. And she said, and this is the highlight of, and the, high, of the, the, the headline of the, of the study, I think. I got my daughter back. I got my daughter back. It's a miracle. It's so profound for us. It's a profound change. Now here comes the tears, she said. If somebody told me in August, we'd be sitting here having this kind of conversation in January, I never would have believed it. It's beyond my hopes, beyond anticipation. Somebody turned the lights back on. And one of the other subjects speaking about himself said the following. So I've kind of regrown up again. Um, before the implant, I would say, I think I would be in early mid-teens. After the implant, I would say it's either back to late teens or my actual age. So it accelerated this recovery process to a place where he had been before. So it was restorative, not disruptive, but restorative. And yet the challenge of adaptation to these improvements um, are profound, We're affecting uh, individual relations with your family, family dynamics, and, and, and uh, one person said, I don't know. I just want to think I'm bored, like reading books and stuff. Why? I would have thought that was boring, but I'm using my mind. And it's interesting. I don't know why. It just makes me laugh. But it's amazing to me that I enjoy doing these things like I'm a nerd. You guys made me a nerd. And this, this individual is going back to school after some 19 years uh, after their injury, going back to school. Uh, and doing well. The same person talked about needing new friends because she had changed. She said, I went to lunch with my girlfriend and I told her I liked reading. And she looked at me and said, why? That's when I looked at her and just knew our lives were going in different ways. I need a different girlfriend now. Profound, right? And yet there are barriers to social integration. One, one, one subject uh, said, if there were jobs where you know, people with disabilities that we could look into that work would be helpful. And um, then I said, maybe support groups, you know, other people who are, have this type of disability that he can socialize with, this is a parent, with I think would be good. I'm sure that exists. I just don't know where to go to look for them. In fact, these support groups don't exist and that's part of the problem. And then I wanna just talk about what Congress uh, Blumenauer said about, about maintaining devices after trials. Um, and that's a key important thing Preoperatively, one of the subjects said, my dad asked how long the implant would be supported or maintained. If we went through the study and if it worked super well, his words, or it was nice, his words, was Stanford going to continue paying for it or supporting it? I don't think we asked the cost to replace the battery or not. Where insurance would be standing on it, depending on the exact degree of benefit gained from it. I'd like it to be in per per perpetuity. It'd be nice if they were able to but I understand why at least the school might be forced to stop after a while. We had a meeting a few weeks ago on post-trial access uh, at the NIH uh, discussing these very issues. And then we have um, a, a post-trial uh, subject. Uh, when I asked him, what are your concerns about the future? He said, concerns over the future? I mean, the only thing that comes to mind is replacing the battery. No other than that. Otherwise, they don't understand why the government is not giving me disability insurance or something. Like either cover my medical expenses or cover the disability. Pick one, you know. I'd rather have the job than collect insurance. Plus, the social aspect is also needed. 
Also, sitting home alone all day is boring. I mean, there are so many reasons to go out and get a job and do something. And this same subject, after this part of the transcript, said, I figure I can make $20 an hour. He figured out how many hours a week he could work, how much money he could make during the year, how much a battery recall would cost, how long the battery would last, and did the calculation that not only was it better for him, it was also more cost effective. And then ultimately, it's the need to reconfigure lives. One of our respondents says, you need training in the reentry program. Okay, look, you're back to your old self. Let's discover who you are. I don't know. Let's see what things you're good at now. How do we go about exploring these options? I really believe a structured program. I think it would be an automatic thing. That's what I'd like to see, a program to help people fully understand what their loved one is going through, how to reach out. Oh, my God. Have you got any tips? And the reality is there isn't a program. There isn't a re-engagement, uh, re-entry program for these folks. And I think this is the key point I wanna leave with you uh, with, is that the BRAIN initiative was predicated on novel neurotechnologies, in this case, cognitive restoration. But this is a broader question than a, than, than a science question. It's a science and society question. And that's why I'm delighted also the Dana Initiative is involved with this because they have a new neuroscience and society initiative. So we can create the neuroprosthetic pipeline, but how do we create the social networks that allow people to find new friends, have vocational and academic reentry? There are pathways beyond the central thalamus. There are pathways back into social structures. And I've written about this Rights, in, rights coming to mind in my book, uh, Cambridge University Press. And I've been very engaged in these questions about how we can advance the rights of people with severe brain injury uh, through, the, through the work uh, I've been doing at Yale Law School and through the prism of, of disability law. But you know, the issue really is, I think that, that brain injury and, and disability rights is a civil right we have not yet thought about. The, the outcome for the, many of these people with brain injury, despite the technological and scientific progress, which is really unbelievable and something unthinkable when I was a medical student uh, decades ago, but people are still ending up in nursing homes, sequestered, ignored. Um, they have brains that could be helped. They can be helped. Um, these people are, are segregated in nursing homes that can't take care of them, uh, can't handle their medical complications. They're dependent on neuroscience that is developing, but they don't have access to, and there's an absence of rehabilitation. And I think this is a violation, as I've written, of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the civil rights of this population. So when we think about the brain initiative, we have to think about the neuroscience in society component of this. So what's the next chapter? It's moving from rights to, as Martha Nussbaum has written about, creating capabilities that allow people to flourish. And we need to move from rights to capabilities. The Americans with Disabilities Act, critically important. It accommodates the environment to disability. But writing with my, my students at Yale, we proposed an Americans with Abilities Act in a forthcoming Boston College of Law Review article. And the Americans with Abilities Act empowers individuals and adopts a capabilities approach for patients who are now empowered by neuroscience to engage with the world in a different way. So this is my penultimate slide, and I want to analogize what we're trying to do. There's a whole coalition of folks, uh, the Curing Coma Campaign of, of the Neurocritical Care Society, and it involves probably most of the congressional districts and states that we're talking to tonight, today. 182 participants in 36 states, 64 cities. And when we talk about what it'll take to cure coma, we analogize to the American moonshot. Um, that got us to the moon, uh, Saturn V, the Apollo program, Mercury, Gemini. Um, and, 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 and it took a whole country worth of manufacturing genius to bring us to that point. And this is a national effort. I don't think this is a red issue or a blue state issue. This is a purple issue. And we can all come together behind this laudable thing. And let me close my last slide. And thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of all the patients and families that I've had the privilege to know. Thank you to the members of Congress who supported neuroscience and helped us make this much progress. Uh, and we're so grateful. Thank you very much. And Matt, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Fins, on this exciting idea of points of inflection uh, beyond equipoise, maybe even in uh, 
early uh, clinical studies, uh, this idea of bringing broken brains back to society, uh, the idea of new agency for the impaired and the, all the ethical questions surrounding it. Um, I'm sure the audience has a lot of questions uh, and we will try to address them afterward. I'd like to move on now next uh, to Drs. Jayatri Das and Claire Weichselbaum. And they're gonna talk about how neurotechnologies and neuroscience are impacting our everyday lives. Uh, Dr. Das is the Director of Science Content and the Chief Bioscientist at the Franklin Institute. She's also an invited fellow uh, of the Center of Neuroscience and Society at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, since 2018, she's co-led the National Informal STEM Education Network's Changing Brains Initiative, uh, aimed at fostering national and global uh, collaborations to promote public engagement with neuroscience and society. Uh, Dr. Weitzelbaum is the uh, Dana Foundation Barbara Gill Civic Science Fellow at the National uh, Informal STEM Education Network uh, based at Arizona State. She's a neuroscientist, a science educator. She's passionate about engaging communities at the intersection between society and uh, science. So uh, Drs. Das and Weitzelbaum, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Rizzo. Uh, I will go ahead and share my screen. So first, thank you to, to the American Brain Coalition and the Congressional Neuroscience Caucus for inviting us to be part of this important event today. I'm coming to you from the Franklin Institute Science Museum here in Philadelphia. Uh, as you can see from my virtual background, our award-winning exhibition on the human brain has invited people of all ages and walks of life to connect to brain science, consider its relevance for our lives, uh, and be inspired by its potential for the future. And so I extend an invitation to all of you to visit us whenever you're in Philadelphia. Today, we've heard from our Congressional Neuroscience Caucus co-chairs, the student challenge winners and Dr. Sins about some key areas in neuroethics. Uh, and so today we wanna to zoom out to think about a wider range of research in neuroscience and neurotechnologies where ethical questions are really at the forefront. It's important to have these conversations in the public sphere, sphere to hear everyone's voices uh, because we're here to share a vision for public engagement across these issues that are emerging across the field from the brain initiative and the global neuroscience community, but they're really informed by our personal values, our community values, and our societal goals. So from its start, the Brain Initiative has recognized the importance of bi-directional public engagement. Thinking about how we translate scientific perspectives to communities across the nation, while also curating community perspectives that can then inform and help establish our nation's programmatic and policy priorities. However, historically across different fields of science and medicine, these goals have not always been balanced. Often the direction of information has been one way, really prioritizing the knowledge of experts over the values and the priorities of communities. And so we're now at a point where our exploration of neuroethics has deepened and the research and practice of public engagement with science, technology, engineering, and medicine has matured. And so we see an opportunity at this point in time to bring them together intentionally and meaningfully. We know that issues in neuroethics extend beyond the directions and practices of medical research, especially as those applications are transferred from medical research into society at large. And I would encourage all of you to read that essay um, from Ashley, our high school uh, competition winner, who really reflects um, on some of those issues that emerge as those applications expand. And so to think about the future, we must collectively imagine what we think about the applications of these emerging discoveries of neuroscience and how they're going to shape our society. So in our field of public engagement with STEM, we build on what we do every day to develop new approaches that bring people together to learn, share, and dream about the future of neuroscience in our society. So I'm gonna turn it over to Claire right now to share some of these key questions across neuroethics that are guiding the field. Thank you, Jayatri. 
Um, at the 2018 Global Neuroethics Summit, a set of guiding ethical questions for neuroscience research was developed by members of the International Brain Initiative, a consortium of large-scale neuroscience research programs all over the world, as you can see here, uh, which includes the U.S. Brain Initiative. The five neuroethics questions that came out of this work cover a wide range of issues, uh, you can read much more about them in the 2018 paper that the summit delegates published in the journal Neuron if you're interested, but I'll just give a quick summary of each of these five questions now. The first question explores potential social and cultural impacts of understanding the biological basis of neurological and mental health. We need to consider this larger context of neuroscience research and the potential unintended consequences it might have for individuals, communities, and society, particularly when there may be social stigma or cultural biases associated with that research. And this also includes an awareness of the values and assumptions that we all bring to this work, such as how we define wellness and illness or normal and abnormal. Secondly, the group highlighted the need for ethical standards of biological material and data collection. Of course, of course, protections for personal data and biological samples are important in every field, but there are some potentially unique issues raised by brain tissue and neural data, since the brain is so fundamental to our identity and we're used to a basic assumption of mental privacy. Neuroscience research, therefore, requires especially careful consideration of policies around data sharing and storage, participant de-identification, and other kinds of privacy protections. The third neuroethics question focuses on the moral status of neurotechnologies developed to serve as proxies for the human brain, such as uh, the beautiful neural organoid you see in this image, which shows cellular organization similar to a real human brain, despite being grown from transformed skin, skin cells in a lab. These kinds of neural systems, which also include brain computer interfaces, chimeras combining human and animal cells and potentially computational models of the brain raise questions about where we draw the line between human and non-human and how we should interact with technologies that might begin to blur that line. The fourth question raises the issue of how autonomy might be impacted by technology that allows us to modify someone's cognition, emotions, and even behavior. That might be for intentional, very valuable reasons, such as the life-changing deep brain stimulation for brain injury that Dr. Finns just presented. Um, or one can imagine neurotechnology with unintended side effects as well. Um, and this also raises the issue of responsibility for one's actions when those actions might be influenced by such a device. Lastly, question five emphasizes the need to consider the wide variety of contexts in which neuroscience research and neurotechnology could be applied. You can imagine a technology that restores cognitive function might be incredibly value in a valuable in a clinical context, but raise very different questions when sold as a consumer product for neuroenhancement, for example. How should a technology be regulated? What is the potential for misuse? Are there issues of equity and access that might arise as the technology becomes available? These are all critical questions that even basic science researchers need to be considering. And in our public engagement work, we propose that it's not just the scientists who should be thinking about these questions. Clearly, these are not questions that can be answered by the scientific community alone. They require ongoing dialogue between scientists, ethicists, policymakers, patients, and members of the public at large. So Claire and I represent two institutions that are collaboratively leading the National Informal STEM Education Network. The NISE Network has a national reach through over 700 partner organizations, including museums, libraries, universities, community organizations, and more. We probably have a community partner somewhere in your constituencies. And with these partners, we've connected with communities to talk about current issues in STEM, ranging from nanotechnology to synthetic biology to earth and space science. And we know from our network that public audiences are interested and excited to talk about brain science and what it means for our lives. 
We also know that scientists and ethicists are ready to hear from public audiences. So how do we actually do it? <laughs> In 2019, through funding from the Kavli Foundation, I co-led a NISE network study to understand global efforts towards engaging public audiences in neuroethics. We talked with people around the world working to connect with diverse communities, talking to people uh, invested in research, in neuroethics and neuroscience, talking to people in patient advocacy, in coordinating research involving human subjects, and those in STEM education as well. And what we found were five categories of strategies that provide an evidence base for effective public engagement. So first, we found structured assessment of public opinions and attitudes, whether these are through deliberative dialogue and community forums, interviews or public polling surveys, or online comment analysis on published uh, journalism or other work around these neuroethical issues. A second strategy that I'm particularly familiar with uh, is through exhibits at you know, museums uh, or public programs in a variety of out of school time environments from after school programs to camp um, to public science festivals. A third strategy is to use media, thinking about art, theater, film, and radio. When it comes to neuroscience and its relevance to our you know, core humanity, these artistic formats have a way of connecting people to ideas and philosophies in ways that really strengthen the impact of a scientific conversation. Fourth, we found many examples of expert, dis expert discussions for public audiences, often thinking about panel discussions with question and answer, um, and often, but not always, <laughs> including the voices of um, patients like those in Dr. Finn's study or someone like Jake who can contribute their lived experience to that conversation. And finally, thinking about partnerships for clinical uh, applications. Having those voices at the table can help shape research priorities or improve participation and outcomes of different studies or change public attitudes at large. And so you can see from, our, uh, from this graph here, that the implementation of these different strategies um, varies widely, um, oftentimes by just what is practical and easy to facilitate rather than what might be the most impactful. And overall, what we also found that was for the most part, these efforts have not been aligned with the key neuroethical questions that Claire described that are really driving the field and the research. So based on our landscape survey, we've identified four key opportunities to advance public engagement with neuroethics. First is to foster more collaboration between scientists, ethicists, and experts in other fields, whether it's social scientists or patient advocates or artists um, who can really bring other perspectives uh, to think about these questions. Second, we know from the NISE Networks partnerships that there are local networks already in place to think about and collect input on community perspectives across a wide variety of topics. And we can intersect with those networks to bring neuroscience into those conversations. Third, we need to expand training resources, especially for early career professionals, as we think about how to infuse neuroethics into the practice of neuroscience and the research development of neurotechnologies. And finally, how can we create shared resources for facilitating dialogue and mutual learning between experts and public audiences? We don't need to reinvent the wheel every time if we have resources that can easily be adapted or translated into different formats to address different topics. We can bring that bar down for participation. So to give you a flavor of how we can collectively imagine the future impact of neuroscience on society through an ethical lens, I'm gonna turn it back to Claire for some uh, public participation right here. <laughs> She's gonna lead us through two thought exercises. Um, so Claire, take it away. Thanks. So we're developing a whole variety of public engagement tools to help facilitate these kinds of conversations. 
Uh, and while most of them are a bit too interactive for a Zoom webinar where uh, we, we can't all see each other, we'd like to give you just a taste of what this can look like using a few quick polls. Please note that these polls are completely anonymous. There are no right or wrong answers. The goal is just to encourage some self-reflection and collective sharing um, on, a, on a group level within this group uh, about some of the ethical questions I described earlier. So if we can pull up our first poll, and I'll read through these options as you're considering them. So which of the following uses of your data would you be comfortable with? And keep in mind, these are all technologies in various stages of development. These aren't decisions that we have to make in our own lives on a day-to-day -day basis yet, but they might be in the not too distant future. So which of the following uses of your data would you be comfortable with and, and select all that apply? Your public social media posts are analyzed by a tech company as part of early detection efforts to present to prevent violence. Facial recognition technology at your local shopping mall is used to predict your emotions and provide customized product recommendations. Your state health department asks you for an anonymous mouth swab to assess community mental health and allocate funding for more treatment resources. Your child is asked to wear a headset at school that monitors their brain activity so their teacher can provide more customized lessons. And you have to undergo a brain scan before testifying in court to prove you are telling the truth. Or option F, none of the above. So we'll give everyone just a second to go ahead and select all the options there that you personally would be comfortable with in, in terms of how your brain and behavioral data would, would be used. Um, and then let's, let's go ahead and, and show the results of that poll. While we're, we're waiting for those results to pop up, I'll note that you know, e each of these options uh, could generate an entire discussion in itself. And I'm sure you all have lots of questions, uh, details you want clarified, like who exactly would have access to this data, what kinds of privacy policies uh, would be in place, how accurate or effective the technologies would even be for their stated purposes. Um, but remember that those are all open questions right now that we as a society need to define. At, at what point is a technology accurate enough, effective enough to be widely used? How should it be regulated? Um, so very interesting poll results here. Uh, you all can, can hopefully see those on your screen. Uh, so I, I won't go through them in much depth, but uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating to see how we all balance the risks and benefits of a technology in, in terms of how they can potentially benefit us and, and society at large. So, okay, let's, let's move on to one more poll. When are you no longer you? Select all the technologies that would alter your sense of identity. Let's go ahead and pull up this poll as well. Let's say you're fitted with a prosthetic arm that allows both movement and sensation via direct connection to your brain. You are implanted with a deep brain stimulation system that regulates your mood. You use a neuroenhancement device that dramatically boosts your memory well beyond human capacity. After a traumatic event, you choose to take a medication that erases your memory of the past 24 hours. Or brain tissue grown from your cells is implanted in a host animal's brain for long-term observation. And finally, F, none of the above. You might feel that, that you would still be you in, in all of those cases. So we'll, we'll give you just a second to select all that apply. And again, you know, these, these technologies range from things that are in clinical trials right now to ideas that are still just being explored in preclinical models, but we need to start having these conversations about their implications now. So let's go ahead and, and show the results of this second poll. Fascinating. I'll, I'll give you all a moment to take a look at that. 
So definitely, you know, we, we collectively seem to feel that some of these technologies do have some potential to alter our sense of self. And uh, while they also may have tremendous benefit to society, these are important uh, questions for us to be wrestling with as we move into these new frontiers. So I'll go ahead and turn it back to Jayatri. So as the brain initiatives move forward, we see three key areas of action to help realize the vision of public engagement with this important research. First, to investigate the neuroethics concerns of brain investigators and public audiences. Just through this activity that we've done here, we can see that our, our decisions are shaped by our personal values, by the potential risks, and by the potential benefits of any particular application. So this needs to be a more nuanced conversation. Second, we think there's an opportunity to develop and evaluate neuroethics education programs. Um, whether it's from high school students like Jake and Ashley to undergraduate and graduate education to uh, other investigators in neuroscience research, um, how do we better integrate neuroethics with training in the practice of neuroscience and neurotechnology research? And finally, how do we better identify successful strategies and models for neuroethics engagement? So this is a practice that is sustainable and scalable as this initiative moves forward. We'll close with a quote from the Brain Initiative Working Groups uh, that, that it reiterates why public engagement is vital to the success of this work. Inviting and welcoming varied perspectives ensures that the science supported by the Brain Initiative reflects the population it serves and that it operates within a full spectrum of cultural norms. Thank you so much for your attention, your participation, and your support. And I'll turn it back uh, for our Q and A, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jayatri and Claire. You raised so many questions. We have so little time left. There are a number of questions in the chat, and I think maybe we can answer some of them uh, offline. Um, uh, I want to say that you've uh, raised a sort of a recipe and a framework for working together. The uh, collaboration across silos, the local networks, the exp expanding training resources, and building shared resources, all very fascinating. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to tackle a question really quickly. The first one is, how would you suggest that ethical concerns of the public be more fully integrated into neuroscience research practices, especially if those public views differ from that of professional ethicists or neuroscientists? Uh, anybody got any thoughts? So I have um, some thoughts on sort of the attitudes that we need to cultivate, and, and then maybe uh, somebody who's more involved on the research side can, uh, can reflect on the actual implementation. Um, I think one of the, the key things to reflect on is that how to prioritize, um, first of all, um, the values of, of public audiences and to be willing to take that into consideration and, and potentially change direction. Uh, I think you know there are you know current practices in science that try to sort of just you know pay lip service to that without really giving the giving it the full um, value it deserves. And so I think there's a shift in mindset um, that has to be accompanied by a change in practice. Thank you, Claire. Uh, I guess we really are out of time now, and we will try to address some of these other questions offline and follow up with you directly. We're so grateful to have members of Congress and staffers, ABC members and other supporters of neuroscience research and the Brain Initiative with us. Uh, for members of Congress and staffers, please, please uh, help us continue uh, uh, robust, sustainable funding in increases for biomedical research, including the Brain Initiative. Uh, this research is a first step in getting cures and treatments to the patients who really need them. Uh, ABC also continues to advocate for policies to streamline advancement and approvals. Uh, many thanks to our speakers for their shrewd insights and to our awesome high school students. Thanks to the Congressional Neuroscience Caucus for partnering with the American College of uh, Neuropsychopharmacology, uh, the Dana Foundation, the International Neuroethics Society, the Simons Foundation, and the ABC for hosting this briefing today. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Happy summer.